For more information, ticket and web stream sales, June 28th and 29th in San Mateo. That's secretspaceprogram.org. All proceeds to benefit the global BEM Breakthrough Energy Movement. And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. The time is 2 p.m. Up next, Tara Verde. From the Amazon Basin, from the magnificent redwoods of California to the icy majesty of the Arctic, life on Earth faces an unprecedented threat from careless development. Join Terra Verde over lunch today to find out about the unfolding future of the planet. Howdy, everyone, and welcome. Howdy, everyone, and welcome to Terra Verde, a weekly environmental affairs show on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. I'm your host, Jason Mark. Earlier this month, on June 2nd, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency issued a draft of new rules for the country's 1,500 power plants, the source of about one-third of the country's greenhouse gas emissions. No matter how you look at it, this is a big deal, one of the most significant actions the U.S. government has ever taken to tackle global warming. You can kind of think of the new power plant rules sort of like Obamacare for the air, numbingly complex to guarantee flexibility and fairness, based in large part on a market mechanism, likely to transform a key sector of the economy for decades to come, and, of course, bound to be controversial. While conservatives wring their hands about another socialist power grab, many progressives worry the draft rules are too little, too late. So how exactly are these new power plant rules expected to work? What will they mean for President Obama's environmental legacy? And are they enough to forestall disastrous climate disruptions? Joining us today on Terra Verde to walk us through the issue are two veteran climate experts. Kate Zyla is direct deputy director of the Climate Center at Georgetown University Law School. Mark Hertzgard is a San Francisco-based writer and the author of Hot, Living Through the Next 50 Years on Earth. Mark got a blockbuster article out in the upcoming July issue of Harper's Magazine about Obama's environmental record. Mark, Kate, welcome to Terra Verde. Thanks for having us. Mark, we got you there as well. He's coming online. Well, Kate, let's start with you. Um, can you explain briefly the, the core elements of the draft rules? How much will they actually reduce CO2 emissions? Sure, happy to. So the, the rule was released under the administration's authority under the Clean Air Act. So this is something that the administration, administration is actually obligated to do through the Clean Air Act. And the administration estimates that it will reduce emissions by 30% from 2005 levels by 2030. But that's not actually the way the rule is set up. It's not an obligation on anybody to reduce 30% exactly. It's actually a set of standards individually placed on different states based on the energy mixes in those states and the potential that the EPA thinks they have to reduce emissions. And each state then gets a standard that it has about a year to develop a plan to figure out how it will implement. And then the states get to come up with a set of policies, whether it be renewables policies, whether it be energy efficiency programs, that they want to put together as the way that they're going to achieve the standard that they've been given. Um, and so it's, the, while these rules aren't specifically targeting coal-fired power plants, the overall goal, right, is to, is to essentially get a phase out of coal, which is the, is the, most, is the dirtiest fossil fuel. Well, the goal is to reduce emissions from existing fossil fuel power plants. So that is primarily coal plants. It's also natural gas plants. Um, but a lot of what will happen here is that you'll see shifts from the use of coal and plants to more natural gas, more efficient natural gas plants. And then what, uh, how do renewables fit in the mix? Renewables are one of the ways that the administration thinks it can reduce the use of the fossil fuel plants. So this is all about reducing emissions from the fossil plants. And so one of the ways they do that is to make those plants work more efficiently. But another way that the EPA thinks these emissions can, reductions can be achieved is by using less generation from the dirtier sources and more generation from renewables, more efficiency programs that reduce the need to generate electricity in the first place. I see. And it sounds like Mark Hertzgard, uh, author and writer, is joining us. Mark, are you there? I'm here, yeah. Fantastic. So, Mark, as, as Kate was saying, um, 
these emissions reductions go from a, a baseline of 2005. Why, why the baseline 2005? Why not, say, 2010 or, or 2014? It seems sort of like a squishy goalpost. Well, 2005 is uh, a squishy goalpost on in two respects. One is the fact that it kind of bakes in a lot of progress that's already been made uh, because the uh, so much of the emissions have already fallen from, from that date because of the recession, that uh, the Great Recession, really, that began in 2008, um, and the uh, things that were already underway. But the more important, I would argue, the more important reason that the 2005 baseline is incorrect is that uh, basically the standard, the scientific international standard for years now has been 1990. All of the scientific projections and diplomatic negotiations that have occurred at the international level about how much emissions have to fall if we're to avoid dangerous climate change have all been, have all been based on a um, 1990 baseline. So when, and this is been true of the Obama presidency since the early days. They have used the 2005 baseline, uh, which is blatantly moving the goalposts. So when Obama first said in his first uh, month in office, uh, when he was backing the uh, came the Waxman Park cap and trade bill, they were saying that they were going to reduce emissions 17 percent by the year 2020 from 2005 levels. And the problem with that is that if you apply the correct baseline of 1990. Those 17% reductions, which at first blush seem pretty impressive, they shrink to 4%. And that is way, way smaller than uh, what science says. Science says that it would have to be at least 40%. So this is not new, what the Obama administration is doing here with these new EPA regs. They've been moving the goalposts for a long time. And so, in fact, this is more modest than it might appear if you were just scanning the headlines. Far more modest. Uh, if you look at it, uh, again, applying the correct 1990 baselines, the president's new proposals here on the uh, existing power plants, you know, he says we're going to reduce it, uh, emissions 30% by the year 2030 compared to 2005. If you correct that and put the proper uh, baseline of 1990, those 30% reductions shrink to 7.7%. That doesn't mean it's not important. It doesn't mean it's not a good first step, but it is much, much smaller than what science uh, requires. Kate Zeiler from the, the Georgetown Climate Center, would you agree with that, that, that while these are important, they're essentially insufficient? I would say they're absolutely important, but will they single-handedly solve climate change? No, they won't. Um, I would say that they are part of, you know, they're not the only program that the administration is putting in place, so I don't think the whole thing has to rest on their shoulders, but I think that they are all building blocks that need to be built on because it's going to take a lot of pieces to get to the reductions that scientists say we need, which are certainly more dramatic than any of these programs alone will get. Right. And, and Kate, it was interesting. You know, even before these draft rules came out, we saw the, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce uh, blasting, um, you know, blasting the proposal. But it's interesting, I think, that industrial interests are not necessarily united in their opposition against this. For example, you've got some utilities sort of cautiously saying um, they might be able to, to play along and work within the rules. Why are, why are we seeing some of the major utilities, um, you know, not, not, not say that this is going to be uh, the sky is falling? I'd say probably a few things. One is that a lot of the utilities who have seen this coming have been thinking for a long time about how they will comply with the need to reduce emissions. I think you see some of the you know, utilities are not all the same. They have very different fuel mixes, and some are much cleaner than others. And so you'll see the ones who have cleaner generation seeing potential to benefit from the program. You'll also see that a lot of the flexibility the program builds in gives states a lot of options for how it will comply and gives companies a lot of options then for how they will comply. And so I think companies see a lot of space to, to get to these numbers in a number of different ways that they think are actually pretty achievable. And I think you see the EPA even saying in the rule that the reductions it's looking for are not the maximum possible. They are what they think is economically achievable and feasible and technologically feasible. And so they're, they're giving the states room to get more from one area and less from another area and to devise the mix of reductions that the states think makes the most sense for each of their individual situations. And Kate, you mentioned at the beginning of the show, this is Mark, before you joined in, that uh, the president is acting under his, his authority under the Clean Air Act. Um, 
I'm wondering if you could talk about that because, I mean, again, some of the scaremongering you've heard is that, well, this is a, a overstepping the president's authority. But correct me if I'm wrong, the U.S. Supreme Court has already ruled in a couple of cases that uh, CO2 is, is a pollutant. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. The, the Clean Air Act requires EPA to regulate air pollutants that endanger public health and welfare. And the, the big case that, that really first decided this was Massachusetts versus EPA, where the Supreme Court said it sounds like greenhouse gases qualify. EPA, go tell us whether these endanger public health and welfare. And the EPA went through its process and found that they do, in fact, endanger public health and welfare. And therefore, they are obligated to regulate under the Clean Air Act. And so it's it's not the administration going off on its own and doing something that Congress never asked it to do. It's, it's part of its obligation under the Clean Air Act, and that's been affirmed by other Supreme Court cases since then. And, and yet, Mark Hertzgard, even though the, the EPA has got essentially a winning streak uh, in the courts on this, we're likely to see litigation when the rules are finalized next year. Um, do you have any sense of you know, what, who the plaintiffs are going to be and what people are going to charge against these rules? The history of the last 40-plus years since the Clean Air Act was first <laughs> enacted in 1970 suggests that industry always sues, always sues, and always loses. But they uh, are able to drag things out and delay uh, the process, and that's essentially what the game will be here. Who it will be, I don't really know, and I, I'm as a reporter, I'm much more comfortable with describing what's happening than predicting what will happen. But... If we look at the past, certainly groups like the uh, Chamber of Commerce and others will probably be represented. Well, in describing what's happened in the past, I mean, we've heard, you know, in the past, you could look at, say, when uh, the, the auto companies were mandated to put in catalytic conver converters, we were told, oh, it's going to crush the American auto industry. I mean, in general, the the Chicken Little routine has got a pretty poor uh, record of, of um, actually coming about, right? I mean, we hear these warnings, but they don't they don't actually crush the economy. Yeah, I mean, what's amazing is because uh, we, we keep hearing it over and over, you wonder why does it continue to work? Why is it that, that every time, uh, like Pavlov's dog, you know, it, you're going to see these uh, arguments being made, you're going to hear them on the uh, talk shows, you're going to hear them on the, uh, the Senate floor and the House floor, and they're taken seriously time and time again, even though historically um, we've seen that they don't come true. So I, I don't, I'm not sure quite what the explanation for that is, but uh, hopefully we can recognize that, that this is the same old game that's, that's long been played, and it's, it's time for it to be retired. This is Jason Mark, and you're tuned to Terra Verde, a weekly environment radio show on KPFA and KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. Today we're talking about the EPA's new draft power plant regulations with Kate Zyla from the Georgetown University Climate Center and environment writer Mark Hertzgard, who's got a big story in the July issue of Harper's Magazine about in Obama's environmental record. Speaking of which, it seems that the president has finally found his voice on this issue. Let's listen to a clip of President Obama last weekend speaking at the commencement address at UC Irvine. We know the trends. The 18 warmest years on record have all happened since you graduates were born. We know what we see with our own eyes. Out west, firefighters brave longer, harsher wildfire seasons. States have to budget for that. Mountain towns worry about what smaller snowpacks mean for tourism. Levels of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere are higher than they've been in 800,000 years. Mark, in your Harper's article, uh, there's, a, there's a, just one environmental activist or campaigner after another complaining that the president has not, or at least during the last six years, did not use his megaphone. Do you think the president has finally found his voice on this issue? I think the president always had his voice, and he has not used his voice until now, in large part because of, uh, as I reported in the Harper's Magazine piece, uh, his aides, his political and economic aides, were uh, against it. And uh, there's a very memorable quote in that Harper's Magazine piece from John Podesta, who is now um, de, de facto uh, Obama's top climate aide and who ran the transition team for him in 2008, where uh, I interviewed him uh, a couple months ago, and he said that basically Obama has not achieved what was needed on climate 
climate change. And he blamed a lot of that, obviously, on opposition from Republicans. But he made a point of singling out uh, the president's own staff. And he said that during the first term, and especially the first two years, that uh, the people in the White House, quote, were not there on climate change. And he added uh, that those aides' uh, attitude was, quote, yeah, yeah, fine, 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 but climate change is ninth on our list of eight really important problems. Now, since January, when Mr. Podesta rejoined the administration, I think you've seen a, an unmistakable effort on the part of President Obama to both find his voice and to push policy proposals like the new EPA regulations to change this. And I must say, the most impressive and, and newsworthy thing that Barack Obama has said on climate uh, has passed all but unremarked, and it appeared uh, in the New York Times on January, sorry, on June 8th uh, in an interview with Thomas Friedman, the columnist, where Friedman said, you know, are you aware of this new science on the part of the International Energy Agency and others saying that two-thirds of the Earth's remaining fossil fuels must be left underground, unburned, if we are to avoid two degrees Celsius and the terrible uh, catastrophic climate change that would follow. And Mr. Obama said, yes, that he agreed with that science. And Friedman followed up and said, do you therefore say that we can't burn it all? And Obama said, we can't burn it all. That, unquote, and that is a stunning, almost revolutionary statement on the part of the United States president, because he's essentially saying that two-thirds of the fossil fuels have to remain in the ground. And that means that... <clears throat> Basically, you can't have more fracking because fracking is all about getting those remaining two-thirds. You can't have more exploring for oil and gas, which is something that Exxon and Shell and Chevron spend anywhere from 10 to $20 billion a year doing because why would you explore for gas that you can't burn? Uh, and a whole number of, of other things. So that is, a, uh, I think, a major news development that – oddly has not been noticed uh, by the rest of the media, by the policy discussion, much less by the American people yet. But if he continues to speak that way, uh, I think that's incredibly important. And it, it then raises the question of, well, Mr. President, why are your policies not in accord with what you have just said is the uh, the science of climate change? I mean, one of the things I thought in your story, Mark Hertzgarten, again, this, the article is called Promises, Promises in the July issue of Harper's Magazine, was the quote, or really, I guess, absence of a quote from White House science advisor John Holdren. And some listeners may know that John Holdren, longtime professor here at UC Berkeley, uh, started the Energy and Resources Group, a real uh, eminence grease in, in the scientific community. When you asked him whether uh, the, the Obama administration's policies are sufficient to keep us within a two degrees global, uh, two degrees Celsius global uh, temperature rise, he wouldn't answer the question. I mean, that, that was kind of chilling to me. He simply ducked the question. And <clears throat> it was, my, my question was even a little bit more pointed than that. I said, you know, the president has this so-called all of the above energy policy, which does increase funding for solar and wind and a lot of green energy, but far bigger increases for oil and coal and, and natural gas, such that the United States has now passed Saudi Arabia as the world's leading producer of oil. And that was the question I put to Mr. Holdren, to Gene McCarthy, the EPA administrator, to Carol Browner, who in the first term was the uh, climate and energy czar inside the White House. Not one of them, not one of them could square the president's policies with the need to keep uh, temperatures under two degrees Celsius because it can't be squared. Kate Zyla, it can't be squared. I mean, is this kind of a, a, a case of the the right hand not knowing the left hand is doing, or what exactly is happening here? Because we do see, again, the the administration seemingly want to take action on climate change, but then you also have John Podesta, who, again, Mark mentioned, the senior White House advisor, um, then going out the White House briefing room and, and bragging about how much oil and gas extraction we're doing in the U.S. right now. Yeah, I think there are a few things going on, and one of them is that while the administration has the authority under the Clean Air Act to reduce emissions from power plants. It doesn't have the authority to do whatever it wants. It has to show that what it's asking for is the best system of emissions reduction that is adequately demonstrated. And so it has to show that the types of strategies it thinks states will use are usable and are economic and are feasible. And so it, it to some extent, has to play this somewhat safe and I think is doing its best to take reasonable, achievable, ambitious but not unrealistic steps. And so I, I think it's seeing this as building blocks and as taking steps forward. And I think that's 
generally what the United States tends to do. Instead of one big single solution that solves everything, we tend to do it in these little steps, and it's in the right direction. It's maybe not everything, but it helps. And yet it would seem to me that that is, you know, there's not a, there's not a good historical analog for global climate change um, and that we may have to, I don't know, take, take, take bigger steps. I'm wondering, Mark, again, wearing your reporter's hat, not asking you to, to forecast in the future, why, having done all this reporting, do you think if the president is aware of the science, they haven't done more? That's a good question, Jason. I think uh, a couple things that uh, the first explanation is that, you know, Barack Obama presides over what uh, over a nation that is essentially an OPEC nation in everything but name. Uh, since the 1930s, big oil has been working hand in glove with the State Department, with the White House, with the CIA to secure overseas oil supplies. And that has been a through line for a very long time in American history. And oil has also been a very important part of American economic history. If you look at the big post-war boom after World War II, uh, the building of the suburbs and the building of the interstate highway system and all of the things that happened there that ushered in this golden era of economic growth, that was all predicated on uh, basically having an abundant uh, supply of domestic cheap oil. So it's not surprising that big oil has a very central role in the political economy of the United States. And so I know that a lot of environmentalists criticize Barack Obama for not being stronger and, and fighting for pollution controls and reducing emissions and all that. And I, I think that's uh, correct. But I would simply say it's not surprising. When is the last time that you saw uh, any OPEC nation, the you know, a Saudi sheik, say no to its oil industry or a Nigerian strongman or a Venezuelan strongman say no to their oil industry? It doesn't happen easily. And the only way that any president of the United States, Barack Obama included, can really stand up to big oil is if uh, that president is given constant pushing and political cover by strong pressure from uh, Americans, from the American public. And that's the only way that uh, a president can really uh, say to Big Oil, no, sorry, we're, we're going to um, not give you what you want. So speaking of that political pressure and cover, uh, these rules are draft rules. And so there's now a one-year public comment period. I mean, Kate, can ordinary citizen, can can Jane Listener, who's tuning in right now, go and make a comment about these rules? Absolutely. It's actually a 120-day comment window. It goes through October 16th, and anyone who has an interest can absolutely comment. The, the year window is that the final rule comes out next June, a year after the proposed rule, but you have 120 days to make your comments. 120 days till October 16th, and I believe you can find those at epa.gov forward slash yes carbon hyphen pollution hyphen standards. Um, Kate Zyla, I'm wondering, part of this, uh, Mark was kind of talking about some of the, the geopolitics, but part of this, um, I, I imagine, is that the U.S. has got a stronger bargaining position in international climate talks right now. At least Secretary of State John Kerry and climate negotiators can say, well, we're doing something. Certainly. It's, it's hard to go to those negotiations and say, well, gee, we have this goal, but we have no idea how we're going to get there. It's a much stronger position to say we have uh, emission standards and fuel economy standards on vehicles that will reduce emissions by this much. We have power plant standards now. We have these state programs all across the country, which may not be part of the, the federal requirement, but are certainly a part of the story for how the U.S. is reducing emissions. And so the administration can now go to these negotiations and tell a lot more pieces of the puzzle, a lot pieces of the story, both what the federal government is doing and what all the state governments are doing to add up to the reductions that the country can achieve. So it, it certainly helps them uh, take a stronger position internationally. And when you mention state governments, uh, part of this, part of these new rules will allow for some uh, pollution trading via markets similar to what we've got here in California. I mean, are, do you expect that more states are going to start participating in those in those carbon markets? I think it's certainly possible. The, the rule is really flexible, and so it tells the states, here's a, a rate-based standard, emissions per uh, megawatt hour of electricity that you have to meet, and you can do it in a lot of different ways, and you can even convert that to a total amount of emissions that you want to reduce overall instead of the rate. And states like California, states like the nine states in the Northeast that are part of a, a trading program, um, 
we'll probably continue to use those same math-based, emissions-based programs to achieve the goals. I think other states will stop and look and see, well, gee, does this make sense for me? Is this going to support the economy in my state? Is this going to help the electricity consumers in my state? What's, what's going to work best for me? And I think that's definitely one of the options that they will weigh each state on its own. And I think one of the things that they'll see is that the states that have done this um, have actually seen significant economic benefits within their states. The, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative is the name of the program in the Northeast. And a, a study that came out a couple of years ago found that that program yielded $1.6 billion dollars in net economic benefits for the states that used it. And so I, I think states will really look seriously to see whether this kind of program is, is a benefit to them. But they'll have a lot of options to weigh, and it probably will take them a little while to figure out what's going to work best for them. So looking forward, if, we, uh, if, if the president has um, found his voice and his sea legs on this issue, what else, Mark Hertzgard, in the next couple of years of the Obama presidency, assuming that there, we're not going to see um, any uh, bold progressive action out of the U.S. Congress uh, on climate, what could the president uh, continue to do in his next two years um, to keep uh, pushing, pushing emotions reductions uh, forward? One of the things that uh, John Podesta said in the Harper's Magazine interview with me was uh, to answer that question was uh, that Obama could salvage his climate legacy if he has a breakthrough climate deal with China between China and the United States. The U.S. And, and China are the two climate superpowers on this planet. And if they can come to some kind of an agreement, a meaningful agreement that in particular puts a uh, price on carbon, at least a de facto price on carbon, by which I mean if you agree to a certain limit of emissions, that ends up putting a, a, an, an effective price on carbon. If that happens, that could still be a game-changing development. And I think it's worth uh, noting here that um, Obama has been exploring that possibility since before he was president. In the summer of 2008, uh, after Obama had won the Democratic presidential nomination, but before the November election, uh, there were representatives of the Obama campaign that traveled, who traveled to Beijing and had back-channel talks with very high-level Chinese officials on uh, climate. There have been continuing conversations. And, and more recently, California Governor Jerry Brown has traveled to China and had these kinds of discussions uh, with Chinese officials and talked about how they could learn from California's example of how to have economic growth without um, crippling pollution. So I think that is an area that is worth watching, especially given that um, we're looking forward to in 2015, there'll be a meeting in Paris, December 2015, to have an attempt to write another uh, international climate treaty. Before that, here in September of 2014, the UN Secretary General has called a, a special meeting of, of heads of state to try and build momentum towards having a climate treaty in uh, Paris in 2015. So I think that's something to watch. Real briefly, we've only got a minute here. Uh, Mark Kurtzgaard and Kate Zyla, how would you rate your optimism or pessimism on how we're doing on the climate challenge? Big question. Well, I'd say I'm a lot more optimistic now that we have a proposed rollout and we can really see that there's, there's a structure in place to get some real reductions. I think that's a great sign. Mark Kurtzgaard? I think it's a start. It's a small start, and it's not going to matter uh, as much as it needs to unless there are an awful lot of people who push and push and push. Keystone would have been approved by now if it weren't for those people who have uh, gone out and gotten well, arrested and pushed, and that's well, going to be the, the thanks, key Mark. going forward. You heard it here, folks. you got to keep pushing. Uh, thanks to Mark Hertzgard. Thanks to Kate Zow of the Georgetown Climate Center. Thank you all for tuning in today. That's all the time we have. Thanks, as always, to our engineer, Erica Bridgman. This show and others available at kpfa.org. Have a great weekend. Bravo for Women in the Arts and Black Artists Contemporary Cultural Experience present the Bay Area premiere of Zakia Alexander's Sweet Malady, running June 17th through August 3rd in a benefit for the Bravo Theater Center. Set during Reconstruction, Sweet Maladies follows the story of three recently emancipated sisters and their former mistress as they contemplate a future in a post-slavery America. Based on Jean Genet's The Maids, Sweet Maladies features the work of critically acclaimed actors Britt Frazier, Kayende Koyejo, Stephanie Martin, and Lisa Ann. 
Dan Porter. Sweet Maladies runs June 17th through August 3rd at Bravo Theater Center, 24th in York in San Francisco, and it is wheelchair accessible. Visit www.bravo.org for tickets 